welcome uh, one and all to this joint program. Uh, the General Alumni Association and the Carolina Public Humanities are really proud to be bringing you this uh, lunch with friends and strangers. We've decided to do something um, a little bit light by talking with faculty members about uh, various people that they've come across studying. Um, what I do want to say um, personally is that right now is a very uh, difficult time in the United States. Uh, all across the country we are seeing protests and uh, and activities of, um, uh, from both sides, from uh, police reacting and responding uh, to uh, protests um, for the George uh, Floyd uh, situation and a horrible, uh, horrible uh, killing of George Floyd. We take this very seriously. Um, and when we do these pro projects like this, we want you to understand that by approaching the humanities and looking at figures who have gone through a lot, we might learn something about how we can approach difficult times. So in light of that, um, let us take a look now at our first guest um, who did live uh, through some very difficult times, and that is Pierre de Bourdais. Unfortunately, Pierre de Bourdais passed away a long time ago, but we invite a friend, Dr. Marcus Bull, Andrew Mellon, Distinguished Professor of History, to come and join us and teach us a little bit about this person, Pierre de Bourdais, who also lived through some very difficult times. Is that right, Marcus? He did. Uh, he, he's, his adult life was spent in the uh, later 16th century in France, which was a time characterized by uh, in repeated civil war, peasant revolt, unrest in towns, riot, um, frequent visitations of plague and other epidemics. So in many ways, uh, this was a time and place that has resonances with the modern experience. In fact, the experience was probably uh, more extreme uh, for many people in the, in, at that time. Well, Marcus, we asked you to sort of give us a, a reason why we should study this person. I'm going to ask Paul to bring up the picture uh, with the tagline that uh, you suggested we should uh, refer to uh, Pierre de Bourdais, also known as Brantome, as, uh, go ahead, Paul, bring up the uh, tagline here, the most interesting man in the world. There he is. That is a, uh, you know, many people might be thinking of a Corona beer commercial. No, it wasn't, I'm sorry, Dos Equis beer yes. commercials or whatnot, but uh, why? That's a strong claim, Marcus. Uh, briefly, what is it makes uh, Bourdais the most interesting man in the world? We'll get into some anecdotes later, but go ahead. Well, funny you should mention the beer ad because that was the immediate source of the inspiration for it. And the point was that the most interesting man in the world, according to the Dosikis adverts, was that he was a man of many parts. So I mean this uh, tag, if at least semi-ironically, but the point about Brantome is that he, he lived a very interesting life by virtue of spending it on the margins of the world of a lot of, of very, very important and powerful people. He was himself born into an aristocratic family. He was rich and powerful enough to be granted entry into the world of the very rich and very powerful, the real movers and shakers, though he was never himself one of them. And he wrote a very long series of books, which was posthumously called Memoirs, slightly misleadingly, in which he chronicles his time and in the process talks about many of the people that he knew and met. And he's a great uh, name dropper. So he's sort of like on the second rung out from history, looking in at real history, or at least the sort of big political and military history happening. And that, that why he's interesting is because he knew everybody or claimed to. He, his memoirs are full of references to, did, did I tell you about the time that I danced with Queen Elizabeth I of England? And by the way, she was much better looking than people gave her credit for. I was in Madrid one year and Philip II of Spain turned to me and said, Tom, um, I think you're wonderful. He uh, mixed with the great and the good of the French court, where he spent much of his life. He was known to the most powerful woman uh, in, in France at that time, Catherine de Medici, the personality that sort of looms over later 16th century French history. He had a sort of unrequited long-term crush on Catherine's daughter, 
and Marguerite de Navarre, known, known luridly to history and to Victor Hugo as La Reine Margot. Sure. And he had a sort of thing, as it were, with La Reine Margot that lasted about 30 years. So it, there was nobody he didn't know. There was no historical event he hadn't got some involvement in. So Even you know, when he wasn't there, he sort of made it up. So that's what makes him interesting. He is. So when I did this uh, brief look at at uh, just sort of what comes up when you look for images associated with P Pierre de Bourdet or Brantome, I came up with all of these, you know, uh, accounts, anecdotes, these collections of his stories. You know, the lives of illustrious women, the lives of duels, and you know, anecdotes of duels and whatnot. Um, and it does seem to sort of almost. Um, I don't want to say trivialize, but it get, it lends an element of um, well, fantasy or or uh, just sort of fables and stories about these people without him. But he's involved in some very serious times and some very serious things yeah. that I don't think these titles, uh, for all of his braggadocio, which you're letting us know he liked to talk about that, doesn't actually give us a sense that he. Uh, was involved in some really serious things. Uh, yep. Was involved in serious times and serious places. Yep. How do we how do we balance the uh, per perception of him that these are just cute stories with the fact that he was involved in really uh, moments of import? Well, that, that is that you put your finger on the central problem. That how do you approach very serious momentous history that affects the lives of many people in many serious ways through somebody who combines a, a, a quite discerning, intelligent judgment. He's not blind to what's going on, but combines that with a, a, a rather trivializing, um, lighthearted or jokey approach to matters of life and death or high politics and so on. So I suppose the challenge for a historian is how much do you learn from jokers, or at least from people who are um, relatively blind sometimes to what's going on around them, even as they are perceptive in other ways. So that's why I'm drawn to Brantome. Wow. He wasn't a great intellect, but he was, the, he was often in the right place at the right time. or knew and, some, and we'll learn sometimes not at the, exactly the right place, and he might oh, yeah. tell, but we'll he learn about some of, of those in a though. few minutes. I love those stories. Um, let's let's advance the slide here and take a look at uh, let's maybe go to some origins here. Um, I believe uh, if our next slide is this is uh, the family home. What I'd like to ask, I asked her before we get into the family. I suggested to you, is there someone you could compare uh, Pierre de Bourdet to that might people who don't know Bourdet or this era might know and might be able to sort of make a comparison? There's Obviously, no, nothing is one apples to apples, but no, there is no one exact like for like but if you think of a strange composite of, of, of sort of Alfred Kinsey doing a sex report um, Truman Capote writing sort of tales of the sort of high society and the sort of great and the good sort of uh, uh, you know interacting so Robert Kappa being a war photographer and sort of doing war report and, and sort of describing and capturing violence and then about 10% Walter Mitty wanting to be somebody he isn't. You know, yeah. If you threw those things together, you've got, you've got Pierre, I think. That would be about where I, I come to him. That from. was not at all where I was expecting. That was a great, I love the Walter Mitty sounds an incredibly important part. That's the 10% yeah. you're not sure if he's making it up or not. I, have, I take it. Yeah, I think 10% is general, uh, you know, conservative. It might be more. So the person that I had thought, you know, again, not being very familiar with Brantome, but knowing the idea of these observers to court and observers to people in high places, it made me think of the memoirs of San Simone, but those seem a lot more documentary perhaps than, uh, than Brantome's. Could you make a comparison between those types of approaches to writing about court life? Yeah, it, it's, I suppose the, the key to understanding Brantome is that it, well, to begin with, his memoirs are enormous. In the modern printed edition, it runs to 11 volumes. It's about three feet on a shelf, about 5,000 pages. But it, it's, it's very anecdotal. He's, he, every, every now and then, he constantly reminds the reader, well, why am I writing this? Well, there's a number of reasons I, I can come to later. But one of them was, everybody yours used to say, Pierre, you're such a great storyteller, you should write this stuff down. 
And he's almost writing it down as if he's just doing everybody a favor because he's such a good raconteur. He, he's so good at amusing people and entertaining them with court gossip that writing, down, writing it all down at length was the, just the obvious logical next step. So the point being that two things happen. Very important people that we know from a lot of other historical evidence walk on, have walk on parts in his anecdotes. And you'll, you see a side of these people that you don't see from the more sober historical record. Secondly, though, though the book is called Memoirs, it isn't an autobiography. It isn't about him. Mm. However, he writes himself into as many other people's stories as he can. He's like somebody who has a walk-on part in about 300 other films, which is about <laughs> 300 biographies he writes of famous people that he Marcus, knew. Marcus, it sounds like one of those character actors you see like, oh, I know that guy from that movie. Yeah. Who is that guy who keeps showing up? It's funny that the one time that he interacted with some famous person was the most important moment in that person's life. That, that's where Brantome seems to be coming from. It, well, let's let's get a little bit of situating Brantome. This is uh, tell us about this. This is his family home. Is that right? And, yeah. And give us the give us a date of birth and situate us in what was going on in the world when he was born. Yeah, he was born about 1540. He died in 1614, so he lived to his mid 70s, which was good going at that time. He came from a middling aristocratic family. Um, which is to say living a very privileged, powerful and rich existence, but not at the very highest level of the political shakers and movers. Bordet, this is the family chateau, is in a region of France called uh, Perigord, which is um, in the Southwest, still very rural, very beautiful. Mm. He wasn't the eldest son of the family, therefore had no prospect of inheriting um, this. Uh, the chateau uh, and the, the sort chateau of you see before you. The knightly um, noblesse oblige that comes along with it. And, um. Yeah, but, but the, for our purposes, two things are important. He was sent off to be educated in his teens, not to a particularly high standard, but certainly to make him literate and familiar with a wide range of books. Secondly, uh, his family sent him to the royal court to make a career in his teens. And there, off and on, he spent the next 20 or 30 years of his life. So that's, that placed him in this environment of anecdote and proximity to power and the hurly-burly of hundreds of people attending the person of the royal family. So he was sort of thrown into the centre of French national life, even as a fringe player, and that gave him the ammunition uh, to collect and relay these anecdotes and to try and insert himself into the story as much as his relatively humble position allowed him. Now, of course, anyone who is remotely familiar with French history, when you give us that date of, um, uh, when you see that date of uh, uh, 1540, uh, we're, we're starting into some very tumultuous times. Yeah. And uh, certainly there's a dynastic situation going on with the Valois, as well as, the, of course, the main situation is between the Catholics and the Huguenots. Yeah. Uh, what is, where does Brantome come into that world? Well, it means that from about the age of 20 through to his late middle age, he off and on, he was, in, he was involved in the most violent and um, bloody phase of French history, probably bar none. And uh, a series of civil wars starting with a, a sort of overt um, re religious dimension that pitted Protestants against Catholics, um, but then sucked in other social, political, and economic woes. Um, and so in a sense, his whole adult life was defined by these this sort of endless series of, of wars, which sucked in um, a civil uh, unrest, riot, and revolt. So you're, you're never, far away from violence in one mm. form or another in his world. So for all his gaiety and his repartee and his sort of saucy stories of the sex lives of the rich and famous, he's also deeply immersed in a world which is drenched in violence. And he took a full part in that. 
as he um, joined the court, what, what the sort of uh, provincial people on the make would do is try and attach themselves to a clan, a powerful family. Mm. And he attached himself to one of the, the most powerful, the family called the Guise. Sure. The and Catholic the Guise League. were the ultras of the Catholic reaction to any um, um, influence that, uh, that Protestants that is, have in life. That is taking sides. If you're going to align yourself yeah. with Henri de Guise, then you are taking yeah. sides. That's one of the reasons, for example, that he was one of the people who took Mary, Queen of Scots, back home when her, fr her husband, the King of France, died and she was offloaded back into Scotland, but Mary was actually half Guise. She was a Guise. And that was one of the reasons why he um, escorted Mary, Queen of Scots, back to Scotland as a young widow. And we know what happened next. So <laughs> she you know, had years of tension with Elizabeth of England. Well, um, and, and of course, I, I just can only imagine that he has some intimation in his stories that Mary Queen of Scots fell head over heels for him I'm just guessing um, he uh, he he fell head over heels in love with her and just berated himself that he wasn't important enough to catch her eye the same <laughs> script was repeated later with Ren Margot who was notorious for being um, taking a stream of lovers and he, he just spent his later years kicking himself that he, he didn't join that sort of um, uh, party. I could have I could have been could a contender. Have, but, but he sort of became her literary muse and sublimated his frustrations into being her literary partner. So does he remain um, uh, associated? I mean, certainly um, if we follow our history, being on the side of Henri de Guise is not going to be on the winning side forever. So how does he manage, um, uh, for those that don't follow French history, no. and Henri IV is the, is the great uh, first Bourbon king who repudiated uh, his uh, Protestant faith and a, a whole lot there. How does he fit into this? Is, how does he survive, I guess, is the question. Well, in the short term, he, he, he moves away from the Guise and latches onto a relatively moderate center group clustered around Catherine de Medici. And his best friend becomes one of the many Italian exiles that, that sort of clustered around Catherine de Medici. He was originally from Florence. And his best friend was a man called Pier, Piero uh, Filippo Strozzi. And it's in Strozzi's company that he is most active in his 20s and 30s. Then what happens is that he doesn't have to confront the later stages of the wars of religion because something very strange happens. When he's in his mid 40s, his, he has an accident, a riding accident, his horse falls on top of him and he's incapacitated for nearly four years. He lies in his bed of, can you imagine this, for nearly three and a half years, permanently strapped to, a, to the sort of one of those appalling devices that only early modern medicine could devise. It was like a wooden frame devised to stretch his spine back into place. It's like the, uh, most of the best doctors had worked for the Inquisition at some point. Right? <laughs> and he'd already dabbled with writing before the accident. He'd written a book on dueling and how you do it. He'd written his sort of Kinsey-esque expose of the sex lives of the rich and famous. But forced to lie immobile for nearly four years, he decided to dictate his memoirs to uh, his patient secretary called um, Michel, and that was the genesis of this much longer writing project. It was forced on him by this excruciating extended period of incapacity. So in that period of time, he was able to avoid some of the more uh, uh, cataclysmic events of the, of the era? Yeah, and he never, and he never um, rejoined the rat race after that. He never went back to court. He was a sort of yesterday's man. Most of his people he knew were dead, courtesy of the dueling or the, or the wars. Or, and so he was, he was, in a sense, made the transition to embittered um, sort of commentator in older age, recalling his youth and increasingly casting the, the days of his youth as a sort of lost age 
uh, you know, the, the nostalgia is pouring out. So in a sense, his horse solved the problem of future political adaptation because he was essentially <laughs> consigned to this um, awful device, screaming with agony, but probably relieving the pain by pouring out these memories. Marcus, it's the power of the humanities uh, we're witnessing there. He found his solace in the four years of pain and doing this humanistic project of you know, yeah. creating his life story. I, I'm yeah. just what? putting a plug out there for the humanities. <laughs> Maybe we could pull up the picture of the Chateau of Brantome itself, the Abbey of Brantome. And I'm curious about, he had to have friends in high places. Yeah. We'll see if we can pull this up uh, to, to get yeah. uh, this. Tell us about, this is uh, where we, uh, Pierre de Bourdais is also known as Brantome after this building and this location. Tell us about this. How does he get involved in this? When does this come into his possession? When, well, actually when he's in his mid-teens, 14, 15. Oh, okay. He is, he, he, he's known as Brantome, which is a, uh, a beautiful unspoiled market town in northern Perigord, graced by this enormous ab abbey, famous for being, you can't see it from this slide, but it's built into the live rock of a uh, cliff. It's what the French call an église troglodytique, a sort of cave sure. church. And anyway, by this stage, he was abbot, which didn't mean he was a monk, far from it but he was simply granted by the king the title of abbot. And, and just to be clear, to he was, which, money. which king uh, granted him at this, this point? Would be, this would um, be um, Henry, the, Henry II. Henry II, um, still the last war. king before the civil wars yes. um, all kick off, really. The sort of the last king of the good old days before it all went wrong. So even if you're the third son, by the time you're in your teens, you might still, uh, he didn't have it so bad. No, no, this is, this is very cushy. He, he, he doesn't have to live with the monks, though he kept a suite of apartments there. At one point, a Huguenot army uh, descended on northern Perigord, and he sort of uh, removed himself post-haste to his abbey and wined and dined the Huguenot generals, including, strangely, um, uh, William of Orange, the, um, the, who was sure. famous in the Dutch Revolt. And he's very proud of himself that he sort of talked the Huguenots out of looting, um, of not to loot Brenton, the abbey, that he, he was the one who bravely stood be between the abbey and the um, sort of iconoclastic destruction that would otherwise have been visited upon it at the hands of the, of the Protestants. So, so um, let me ask it, you a question about that, Marcus. It seems yeah. to me that people like Brenton can either raise the ire of partisans on either side for their lack of commitment or for dilettante and jumping back and forth. Yeah. Um, or they can just sort of be, we admire this. It sounds like he's in the latter category. Yeah. It's Brantome. He's harmless. Yeah. I mean, yeah. it's, it's, I think, I think, and I, it, Marguerite, um, Le, Le Margot says something very similar. It's almost like, you know, I'm, Pierre, just keep writing, you know? <laughs> We love you for the writing. Keep telling the stories. Don't worry about anything else. Just, you're, it, it's almost like, yes, he was a sort of, everybody knew him just as he knew everybody else, but it didn't make him important. That's the, hence the irony of the mm -hmm. most interesting man in the world. But here was one moment when he was able to insert himself into a dramatic moment where he saved, at least he tells us, he saved this abbey from destruction at the hands of, enraged Huguenots. So um, every now and then history came to him mm -hmm. rather than um, um, the other way around. He, he, he witnesses some nasty stuff, you know, that it, his best friend Strozzi was guilty of a war crime. His army, the royal army, was crossing the Loire near the French city of Angers, where the, where the Loire is quite wide, and they were crossing a bridge called the Pont de Cé, which is now a suburb of modern Angers. And the army was being hindered by the many camp followers and wives and partners of the soldiers. And in a fit of pique, Strozzi ordered these gas, as they were called, which is simply the feminine of garçon, girl. Yes. 800 of them were pitched over the bridge at Pont de Cé into the Loire and died. 
in about the space of 20 minutes. He says Strozzi regretted giving the order later on in life, but that doesn't really compensate. And Granton is struggling, you know, what do I make of this? This is, this is real history intruding upon my cozy world and it's awful, but my best friend did it. Yeah. Um, and there's, there are moments in this. It, it, he, and now he had another best friend called Timelion to Brissac, and he, and he spends 30 pages writing a love letter to the memory of Timoleon de Brissac. And then at the very end he says, but there's one thing I'll say about him. When he was kneeling on people and stabbing them, he liked, he enjoyed it too much. And you go, what? <laughs> okay, that, that takes it in a whole different direction. You know, I guess that's not in the dueling book. It's kneeling no. on them and stabbing them is not part of the dueling and the gentlemanly art. No. The and he says, if you see portraits of Timoleon de Brissac, he's very boyish. He sort of had a sort of, you know, sort of boyish look. And, and Branton says, funny look, funny really that he was so good looking, but still loved blood splattering on his face. And you go, oh, that's a thing, Pierre. So <laughs> it, you, you're, every now and then you start to get sort of blasé about the world full of, you know, anecdotes and sort of sexual escapades and sort of, you know, tittle tattle. And then every now and then, boom, this, this extraordinarily violent, ugly world smacks him and you, the reader, right in the face yeah. and there are, there are several moments of that where even Branton's love of nostalgia and sort of chivalry and trying to sanitize everything is insufficient to disguise the fact that he is he and his contemporaries have been pitched into an unusually dysfunctional violent and ugly world yeah certainly and the, you know I, I know you mentioned that even if he was um not necessarily witnessed to some of those violent, horrible acts, considering the most famous one of the wars of religion, the St. Bartholomew's Day Massacre, yeah. they had some sort of effect on his, uh, he felt compelled to talk and address that violence in some yeah. way. Yeah, that's right, because his memoirs are largely about things that he didn't see or participate in. So he tries to grow his role into that of historian, rather than simply limit himself to what he had directly experienced. He want, you can see that he wants to be part of history. The best example of that is that the, one of the, the signature events of the later 16th century in European history was the great siege of Malta, when the Ottoman Turks tried very hard, but failed to dislodge um, the, the Knights of Malta from the island of Malta in 1565. And in 66, uh, he and a, a group of his friends, including Strozzi and Brissac, who I've mentioned, felt that they had been excluded from the biggest single piece of contemporary history available to them. So they went down to Malta to sort of, actually they weren't useless because they helped, they, they didn't know at this stage that the Turks wouldn't come back but in the event they didn't, and so the French, about a thousand of them, just spent three months effectively whining and dining, hanging out on Malta, and then went back to France. But it makes for great stories after the fact, doesn't it? And, but here's the thing, when he writes about these experiences, he, time and time again he says, when we were going to the siege of Malta, when I was going to relieve Malta, so he's lying in his bed screaming with agony he has now folded the story of the siege of malta into his life story even though he, he was a year late so it's it's it but do, don't we all do that in some way that we are sometimes rearrange public history mm -hmm. to think about how we as private individuals matter or participated in it what did you do in the war daddy that sort of thing that it, it looks it, in, in Branton's case it looks quaint or delusional but but maybe he's only doing it in an exaggerated way what we all do I think we do and we have this sort of two things that happen one is the I'll never forget where I was when such and such a thing happened but if you weren't at that place then it's not quite as you know i was in the shower when i heard about 9 11 you know but when you talk about what 9 11 did to us as a country and everyone sort of collectively talks about it then it allows someone like Brantome to kind of insert themselves in and say you know 
it was a big thing, the Siege of Malta, and I was involved in it, and I was a little late, but you all know what I'm talking about. <laughs> and and so in a way, um, when he, his currency was uh, to insert himself into things that people were familiar with um, and to give a plausible account of what he could have done. Um, what is the just of, why does he need to do this? I think, I think it comes down to an awareness that big history is happening around him. That there's something about the scale and consequence of what's happening that you either, that you, if you're Michel de Montaigne, you sort of, you, you sort of ration, rationalize it, you think through it. But, but Baudet is sort of caught. He is, he is a man of action. He's been raised to be a member of the military aristocracy. That his sort of default is to fight your way out of a problem. His, the, value, the values that he prizes, honor, chivalry, physical bravery, are the values prized by the military aristocracy. He doesn't have a plan B mm -hmm. in the way that somebody like the, uh, with the intellectual capacity of Montaigne can. So yeah. he's, he can, he's, he's constrained by a limited world of possibilities, but aware that, that, the, that things are happening that cannot be described solely with reference to his yeah. culture. It, so how do you try and fit very big history into a quite narrow view of the world. And that's, that's what I think the memoirs are trying to do. They're trying to square the circle of coping with the enormity of change and the convulsions around him yeah. while remaining true to a set of values that provide order and stability and a sense of control and a sense of participation, a sense of wanting to be part. Another one example of another big history that he wanted to be part of, however tangentially, was a, what's another big story of the later 16th century? It's the Spanish Armada, the, the failed attempt to, to invade England. Nothing to do in the, in the first case uh, instance with Granton, but he tells us that some of the Spanish survivors who'd been shipwrecked on the French coast mm -hmm would straggle through the French countryside on the way to the Pyrenees to try and get back home to Spain. And he came across groups of these stragglers dying on the side of the road. And he sort of would sort of crouch down and say, well, tell me what it was like. Yeah. So he, in, even in the most sort of yeah. remote ways, he's groping to be part of something bigger than himself because he feels I don't know. If, I don't want to get into psychoanalysis. Yeah. You can't psychoanalyze somebody who's been dead four hundred years. But he wants to be part of something bigger, but doesn't have the tools to do it adequately. You know, it's interesting about what what is important as history that we now look at his work and we find even the questions of why he is doing this in the first place to be an interesting historical question in and of itself. Yeah. We find the mundane things that he might talk about to be just as important and interesting as the fabulous uh, and the fantasies that he's uh, sort of inserting himself into. So uh, it's really interesting how we find historical value uh, in texts that may, may no longer have the value that they might have had when they were written, that someone is purporting to give you a real account. I can't use Brantome as an accurate account of history, no. but I can use Brantome as an absolutely fascinating account of history and how people's impressions are inserted into that. Yeah. Um, Marcus, we're coming to the end of our time. I want to bring up one final picture and then turn to a couple questions that I have. Um, I know that we are just scratching the surface and it's very frustrating, but I'm hoping that it gives people a bit of a taste uh, and that this is a work you're, you'll be uh, producing a work on Brantome's life. So uh, giving people just a taste. So Paul, can we bring up the last picture of the small little chateau that is still, yes, the Chateau de Richemont. Tell us about, uh, very briefly, because we don't have a lot of time, is this where he liked to spend most of his time? Yes, this is where you can picture him um, in his bed screaming with agony. Uh, this, this is a, um, a chateau that he built himself very close to Brantome uh, and Bordet. All the places associated with him are in, in very close together. Uh, this is a, one of a, a very few number of, sh of significant chateaux in France that are still in private hands. In fact, it's owned by um, members of his family who are very proud of that fact. 
and it, it, it the, the, that family has had very little money, so it's it's virtually unchanged since uh, the it's, time when Brenton, I prefer it that way. It looks great. Yeah, I mean, I think he's, a lot he's of buried times... there. He's buried there, um, and in his chapel, and it, it's very ramshackle. It's scarcely been updated si since the middle of the seventeenth century. When you are when you're invited round by Madame la Chatelaine, you are you have to shuffle on two pieces of carpet so as not to damage the 17th century floorboard. <laughs> it, it, it gives you a sort of point of entry into his world like no other. And it's, it's remarkable that of all the chateau in all of France, this is his, this is a jewel. It's a sort of unknown jewel and it takes you right well, into his world. It sounds like uh, going to the Dordogne region of France is, uh, if anyone is going, take, make sure you stop in and, and visit Brantome sites wherever you see them, wherever you can. Yeah. Um, I, we have, um, we're coming to the end of our time. I do have one question I want to get to. It was about uh, Brantome's relationship with the world of art and literature. Uh, yeah. You had already mentioned Montaigne. Um, did he know Montaigne? And just about the art world in general as well. Um, yeah, he, he knew of Montaigne, who is also from the Perigord. He was rather sniffy about him, thought he was too clever for his own good. Um, but Brantome actually has a very interesting literary uh, pedigree that people can pursue, which is another Marguerite de Navarre, an older one who was Queen of Navarre, his, his Brantome's mother, aunt and grandmother were part of her inner circle. And this Marguerite de Navarre is, is most famous for having written one of the most important works of literature in French, the Heptameron. It's, it's inspired by Boccaccio's Decameron, the basic Sorry. plot is the same, a group of people trapped in the Pyrenees by floods tell each other stories to uh, while away the time. And Brantome's uh, mother, father and grandmother and possibly aunt are the historical basis of the characters that inhabit the frame narrative of the heptameron. And therefore, and Brenton was, we know from his many observations, he was immensely proud that his family had this sort of very close up and personal Wouldn't that have a, an influence on his own literary endeavors themselves? I think, it, you know, only a handful of um, aristocrats of his type would have sort of bothered to write memoirs, at least to anything like the length. And I, I suspect that it cannot be proven that his, his family's involvement in a literary classic was his license to, in, to presume to explore the world of authorship. That, that was his, he was in some weird way continuing it, that their tradition of proximity to, to the world of letters. So well, it, it's I, a hunch. I, I think it's fantastic, and we all look forward to this work. Um, when can we expect you being finished with Brantome? Well, uh, give me a couple of years, because okay. so, the, more, the more you read, you find two things new you didn't know. It's, it's one of those subjects. Well, we do hope you'll come back and talk to us more about Pierre de Bourdais. It's been absolutely fascinating. This is the cat that lets us know it's time, apparently. In the world of Zoom calls, uh, professionalism, what can we do, folks? Uh, listen, we want to thank the General Alumni Association for their wonderful uh, uh, co-sponsorship of this program. Marcus Bull, thank you for bringing uh, Pierre de Bourdais to us and introducing uh, him to us. Come for uh, next week, uh, um, excuse me, next Wednesday, Emily Burrell is bringing the, uh, the revolutionary midwife, the Sahel Awaya Keita. Should be very interesting, a very different type of character for sure. And uh, we have these every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday for the next two weeks. Please join us again one more time. Marcus Bull, thank you. Yeah, I want to thank Paul Bonici and the General Alumni Association for all their help. And everyone, we'll see you on Wednesday. Bye now.